and said, as my professor put it, see, here is a horse, shall we not count its teeth? And they threw him out of the monastery for disagreeing with Aristotle and the church fathers. The moral of the story was, you can debate all you want, but it's better to go look at the evidence straight from the horse's mouth. I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to find the origin of this story, but it turns out that nobody seems to know where this story came from. Some have listed the author as Francis Bacon or Roger Bacon or from a chronicle of an ancient monastery or even from an original story about a priest, a philosopher, and an Arab. But I found no evidence of any of those. Instead, the earliest references that I was able to find date back to 1901. One is the second volume of a textbook on the psychology of love printed in Paris, and the other a machinist journal in Washington, D.C. And they are word for word identical. So back to the moral of the story, it's better to go look at the evidence for ourselves than to simply believe what people say. I've heard a lot of stories about Jericho, and what happened there under Joshua. You know, were there chariot races on the walls? Does science support the biblical story? What did archeologists find after all? Lots of people, including professors, give conflicting reports. Would you like to look at what I found out when I checked the facts about Jericho's destruction for myself? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. I've written a new tract and I just needed Fred to draw a single picture of what Jericho looked like when it was destroyed. But you know me, I wanted to do it right. So I got out all the biblical archaeology books and magazines I could and looked online for newer discoveries and analyses. And of course, I had to use Google Earth as well. We are so privileged these days. It's wonderful to use all these resources. And there were a number of articles online where people did some really decent research. So I didn't come up with all this. I'm just telling you what I found when I put other people's findings together. Take a look at Jericho. Looking to the north, you can see it's a hill on pretty flat land close to the mountains and hills to the west. The mountains go 900 feet above Jericho, which is just 200 feet above sea level. Five and a half miles away, the Jordan River is 500 feet lower, 1,200 feet below sea level. And if you cut a slice through the mountains, Jerusalem is up about 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho is 700 feet below sea level. The water table goes down nearly 3,000 feet to the hill of Jericho. So they have a spring and a constant water supply. That's why the ancient peoples made Jericho their first walled city. They wanted to protect that water supply. We're looking at Jericho overlaid on a modern map, a modern photograph, actually. Jericho is 525 feet at its widest and about 1,500 feet at its longest, facing from northeast to southwest. That's about 12 acres total, but how big is that? Let's think of it in terms of football fields. One football field without end zones is 100 yards by 50 yards or 300 feet by 150 feet. Jericho covered the space of 11.6 football fields. It could have held a population, they say, of about 2,500 people. Out in an isolated location with a small population, you want to make good friends and have a big wall. Whoever controls the water controls lives. 
But how big was the wall? Well, thankfully, a lot of people have dug in all around and partly through Jericho to answer that. I have to tell you, most drawings of Jericho are wrong in one way or another. The wall had two levels, an outer level of the wall and an inner wall that connected on the west side. There's a modern road that cuts into what was the outer wall right here. Because they took that spring and made it into a reservoir. So to make way to that for that road, they destroyed a lot of the east side of Jericho. The inner wall was further up the hill and twice as thick as the outer wall. The inner upper level was for the elite, the ruling people, the rich. The outer lower level was for the working class, the poorer people. The walls of the building here are thinner than in the upper level and very close together. Most of the lower housing was between the walls, but some has been found on the wall itself. The Bible says Rahab lived on the wall. It's not easy to get into the city if you don't go by the gate. Take, take a look. Surrounding the city was a defensive, actually out here, was a defensive ditch, according to Kathleen Kenyon, and no one disagrees. It could have held water. So to attack the city, you'd have to go down 10 to 15 feet into a ditch. On the inside of this ditch, on the city side, there was a steep retaining wall 12 to 15 feet high. Then in places was another steep slope. They took that steep slope and plastered it to make it slippery. This is the base of the walls. And this is the plastered side to make it slippery, rising another 35 feet. This right here is a cutaway view. Do you see how the plaster seeped down into the ground? Then came the first outer mud brick wall. It was six feet thick and they say 20 to 26 feet high. There were houses and built onto the wall and others inside between the walls. And there was another plastered slope in parts as well. Then came the second mud brick wall. The bottom was 46 feet above the valley floor. It was 12 feet thick and another rose another 20 to 26 feet. That means you'd have to make it up over 70 feet total to get over the top of the wall to take the city. That was nearly impossible for man, but nothing is impossible for God. The walls were an obstacle to God's people, so God removed the walls. And here's the beauty of it. They fell down and outward over the slippery, steep, plastered slope and over the retaining wall into the ditch. God made a way, or more specifically, a ramp. They were literally able to walk straight up from where they were, just like the Bible says. The whole city fell, but how do we know when it fell? There have been various expeditions. German archaeologists Ernest Sellen and Carl Watzinger explored Jericho in 1907 to 9 and 1911. They covered a large part of the north side. They didn't know about dating pottery, but their theory was that Jericho wasn't inhabited at all between 1550 BC and 1200 BC. British archeologist John Garsting wasn't satisfied with their methods, so he explored Jericho from 1930 to 1936. He examined part of the double upper city wall in here, as well as a large area on the east and toward the south. So this right here is Garstang's area. 
his methods were more advanced than Selen's and Wassinger's, but the, uh, the pottery as well as the uh, scarabs found in the graves by Jericho gave him a date of about 1400 BC when the walls came down, just like the date you get when you take the Bible literally. In October 1941, Garstang wrote, both biblical tradition and our excavations indicate indeed the same reign, that of Amenhotep III, and the central figure of 1400 is the nearest approximation to the date that evidence can support. Garsting asked Kathleen Kenyon, an up-and-coming fellow British archaeologist, to review his work and to bring his findings up to date. But that's not what she did. Kathleen Kenyon explored Jericho from 1952 to 58. She carefully cut into the retaining wall on the north, west, and south so that we could see their layers. Then she dug to 26 foot squares on the east, north of Garsting's dig for her main work. Then she stated her conclusions. She died before she fully published her findings. And you know what? She never did check Kenyon's work like he asked her to. She just went her own way and ignored some pretty important facts, then died before she could fully publish her findings. But Kenyon publicly stated repeatedly that she had found no evidence whatsoever of any people living in Jericho between 1550 and 1200 BC, like Selen and Watzinger said. After that, most scientists just wrote off Jericho and using the Bible for archeology. span They trusted Kenyon more than the Bible and believed that the Bible was nothing more than religious folklore and incompatible with modern archeological findings. As a result, more than a generation of archaeologists largely dismissed the Bible, saying it wasn't an accurate record of historical events. Then came Bryant Wood. In the 1980s, Bryant G. Wood, an expert in pottery, examined the finds of all the previous researchers, especially their pottery. I'll get back to this. But first, let me tell you two really cool facts. First, number one, the walls fell, then the city was burnt. Kenyon herself admitted this. She wrote, the destruction was complete. Walls and floors were blackened or reddened by fire, and every room was filled with fallen bricks, timbers, and household utensils. In most rooms, the fallen debris was heavily burnt but the collapse of the walls of the eastern rooms seems to have taken place before they were affected by the fire. The walls fell, then the city was burned, just like the book of Joshua. In Joshua 6.20, the walls fell. Then, four verses later, and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Joshua 6, 24. The walls fell down and out, number two. That's why there are fallen mud bricks all the way down the ditch in the bottom of the retaining wall. Amazingly, it was Kathleen Kenyon herself who proved this when she dug in the northwest and south retaining walls. The walls crumbling and falling covered all the slippery, steep slope all the way down. As I said, God provided a ramp so they could walk straight in. Kenyon admitted the mud brick in the ditch came from the wall on top. This is just like the book of Joshua. Joshua 6.20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with their trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took 
the city. But the big question is, when did this happen? According to Kenyon, Joshua would have had no trouble with Jericho because there wasn't a city. So there wasn't a city wall either. Now I'll tell you about Bryant G. Wood. He spent his time doing stratigraphic pottery analysis. This means he found remains in layers in the ground from ancient cities that were known to be destroyed, boom, at a certain time. That means the pottery was from that time or before. So as more of these datable historical layers were found, it became obvious which styles of pottery were made at which times in history. You could date a layer by the pottery that was in it. While he was working on his PhD dissertation in Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age, he went through Garsting's reports on Jericho from 40 years earlier. The pottery that Garsting found was now known to be from the late Bronze Age I, 1550 to 1400 BC, the exact time that Kenyon said was missing from Jericho. Wood published his findings in 1990. Here's what I found interesting. Number one, Garsting had found two color pottery from the Isle of Cyprus with either red, red or black geometrical patterns called Cypriot bichrome ware. Garsting had no idea of its significance and had it in his notes, but not set apart. But it turns out this kind of pottery was only in use from 1550 to 1400 BC. Two, Kathleen Kenyon based her dating on the supposed fact that that very pottery was missing. And yet here it was the whole time in Garsting's notes and pictures that Kenyon had been asked to verify. Didn't she honor her agreement? Kenyon also didn't investigate Garsting's dig site any further. If she had, she would have found that Garsting dug down the hill from a palace where more expensive pottery had slid down. Kenyon's two holes were further north in the poor part of the city with no rich stuff slid down. So all she found was poor people's pottery. There are so many pictures I could show you, but I have to keep this short. Number four, the layer of ancient Jericho called city four had numerous types of pottery that the common poor people used. They were found all over Jericho, but Kenyon strangely ignored it. She was only interested in the rich Cypress pottery, but the common pottery was of a kind in use between 1550 and 1400 as well. And one type, type two here, the round-sided bowl with the internal concentric circles, was only in use for a short time between 1450 and 1400. Talk about narrowing the date, but there's more. Cities have cemeteries. People often bury things of value with the dead. Jericho had a cemetery just to the northwest. In it were specific scarabs, beetle-shaped amulets with inscriptions from the 1800s into the 1400s or late 1300s. Did you get that? 1800s right down through the 1400s or even late 1300s. The ones that were most interesting were of Thutmose III, Amenhotep III, and Hatshepsut, who some say was the princess who adopted Moses. Those nailed the date as somewhere close to 1400 BC. Each time something datable by ordinary means like destruction layers and dated artifacts is checked, it keeps on giving the same end dates, 1550 to 1400 BC, and more specifically, 1450 to 1400 BC, but not after 1400 BC. I've saved the best for last. Here are five more powerful things that we can know about the destruction that occurred right around 1400 BC. And they all come from one thing found throughout Jericho, jars of grain. Number one, they were full. So we know what time of year this was. 
spring, between March and May. They had obviously just had a harvest and had filled their pots all over the city. This matches the Bible. Joshua 3.15 For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. Joshua 5.10 And the children of Israel kept Passover on the 14th day of the month and even in the plains of Jericho. Number two, Egyptians and others only besieged a city at the last part of the year before harvest so the people would starve and the Egyptians would take the food right from their harvest as they surrounded the city. So this wasn't like Egyptian warfare at all. Number three, the pots were full, so it wasn't a long siege at all. People who are surrounded during a siege eat up all the food and either die or surrender. So whatever happened didn't take long. This matches the Bible. Joshua 6, 15 and 16. And it came to pass on the seventh day, and verse 16, And it came to pass that the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Number four, the people who took the city burned all the grain. But grain was valuable. First to feed your army, and even if you had your own food, grain was like money. It was really valuable. Five, there is no reason on earth to leave full pots of grain unless you were commanded not to take it. This matches the Bible, Joshua 6, verses 17 to 18. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Why did I do all this work? Because I've been told different stories for 38 years now. And I really wanted to have some answers. But what started it was a single picture I needed Fred to make for my next track. It was of the destruction of Jericho. I set it by GPS, photographs, diagrams, and all that you saw. And because you've been patient, I'll let you see the end result, including where I think Rahab's house really was. Here it is. Right there. It would be next to where the gate was. On the north side. The Bible is true. The Bible is trustworthy. The Bible is literally correct in all that it contains, understood properly in its context. And the Bible is the best source for accuracy about what really happened in history. How, why, when, and where. That's why I trust the King James Bible over 400 years tried, tested, and proved, nothing added, nothing taken away. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.